actually at speeds greater than the human eye. The human eye moves at about 500 degrees per second, and our camera could move at about 1,000 degrees per second. But, um, so we were kind of influenced by this whole uh, idea of, of minimalism in robotics. Um, my, my, um, my motto at that time was maximize your minimalism. Um, well, around that time, and this is coming back to the story of Turing again, uh, around that time the first Loebner contest was held. And, okay, so now I'm going to switch the metal to the obverse, which is the front side, and there's a picture of Hugh Loebner, the sponsor of this contest. And uh, Loebner, Hugh Loebner um, has a PhD in sociology. He owns a metal fabricating company in New Jersey and seems to be independently wealthy to the point at least where he can fund this annual contest, which is an annual real world Turing test. So it's a contest to try to find a computer that can have a natural language conversation in the way Turing imagined. So judges come in and talk to one terminal which is connected to a computer and another terminal which is connected to a human and they try to decide which one is which. Well, I remember reading about the first Loebner contest in the New York Times in 1991. The contest was held at the uh, Boston Science Museum and it was sponsored by the NSF. The basic, the basic story with that contest that year was that none of the programs came close to passing the Turing test. It was very obvious which ones were computer programs and which ones were people. But uh, that year and in subsequent years, they did give an award to the program that came closest to having a conversation, like a human. And the program which came closest was based on the old Eliza Psychiatrist program. None of the more sophisticated uh, approaches which were advocated by the academic elite at the time could perform anywhere near as well as this very simple stimulus response program. Well, that sort of set off a light bulb in my head because I thought, well, you know, this, this minimalist stuff that we're doing in robotics, which is creating all these great things like the Roomba, maybe that can be applied to more sophisticated things like natural language conversation. Well, I didn't really do anything about it at the time um, because I was involved in other things. And then there was another huge development in the early 90s, which was the, um, the appearance of the World Wide Web. So the World Wide Web came along, and we um, decided to try to connect our little robotic camera to the World Wide Web. And it was one of the first webcams, one of the first web robotic devices. Um, people, could, people could visit our website, see an image of, the, of our lab, and uh, click on the image to move the camera left or right, up or down. Um, and then I remember going to the second World Wide Web Conference in Boston, I think that was in 94, 93 or 94, and um, um, I was a bit shocked because there, were, there was a huge number of people there doing stuff around the web, uh, which is not surprising now in retrospect. And Whereas I had previously been able to attend robotics conferences and computer vision conferences, and uh, if, I, if I can say this modestly, be one of the stars of the conference because of our, our approval of robotic eye invention, I went to the World Wide Web conference and I was a nobody. <laughs> so I decided that, that you know, I had to do something to respond to this. And um, I went back to my lab and created a, um, a text-based connection to the robot camera. So underneath the, underneath the image of the robot camera on our web page, there was a little text area where you, people could type in commands. And the commands were intended to be very simple things like zoom in, pan, pan left, you know, turn right, look up, that sort of thing. And then I quickly realized that people were actually trying to have conversations with the camera. So because they would say, hello, how are you? Goodbye. <laughs> the profanities. <laughs> All that sort of thing. <laughs> Sometime around this time, my attention was also drawn to the work of a guy named George Kingsley Zipf. And um, this Zipf was a 
almost an exact contemporary of Turing, but his life is far less tragic. He was a professor at Harvard, and uh, Zipf was interested in studying the distribution of words and phrases in natural languages. So um, Zipf was also independently wealthy, and he could afford to hire rooms full of people whose job title was computer. So what these human computers would do is to, for example, take an issue of the New York Times, scan through it, and count up the number of times every single word occurs. So you know, the word like a uh, might occur 5,000 times. The word like that might occur 3,000 Cover to cover. Times. Cover to cover in the man. Yeah. Oh yeah. my god. Yeah. And what he found was There's a very characteristic distribution. If you take if you take that if you take that set of words that you've counted and then sort them in order from the most common word down to the least common word. So so in English usually it's ah uh, is the most common word, followed by the, for, by, and if, so on and so on, down to words that occur very rarely. There's a, there's a characteristic distribution of those words, which is now called ZIPF's law, Z-I-P-F law. And if you plot that, so along this axis I have, you know, uh, the, for, by, uh, and, and so on. The curve should have a shape like that, which is a, a 1 over x hyperbola type of curve. It's not a hyperbola, it's a um, 1 over x is a another type of curve. <laughs> but specifically, what, what Zip said was that if you plot this on log log paper, maybe some of you remember what that is. Um, so if you take the log of both axes, then you should see a straight line with a slope of minus 1. Okay. That's now, if, 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 if you take this curve and plot it on log log axes, then you should see a, slope, a straight line with a slope of minus 1. Uh, so if the words in the language were random, distributed equally with equal random probability, then these curves would be flat. Okay. So you can actually use this as a kind of measurement of natural languages. If you, if, you, if, you find, if you take the histogram of a bunch of tokens in some language and then sort them like this, if you see this zip distribution, then it probably is a natural language. Um, and it turns out that this this um, type of distribution appears in a lot of other things in, in nature and science. And one place we were seeing it on the web was that if you imagine a collection of web pages, a collection of HTML pages on your website, there's one page which is accessed the most often, like your index page. Then there's another page which is the next most often. Then there's a whole bunch of pages which are, which are seldom accessed. So we were seeing this type of distribution all over the place when you start looking at the web data. But in particular, that curve, we found that curve when looking at the distribution of things people were saying to our bot. So um, what that told us was there's, um, it gave us a strategy for creating responses. If we wanted the bot to seem intelligent, work on the most common things people say first. And the result of that is that if you start if you start working on the most common things people say, which are going to be like um, "Hello, how are you? What time is it?" and that sort of thing, then very quickly you'll get to a point where you've covered a huge percentage of the things people say. Okay. So, Zip's law was was an important key piece in understanding how to solve this problem. We had the, we had the ELISA stimulus response program, and then we had the fact that we could, we could add new rules to the ELISA um, type program using this type of ZIP strategy. So um, soon the robotic camera disappeared altogether, and it just became the chatbot. <laughs> the original name of my chatbot was called Panambic stands for pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. 